I love how you, you guys uh, pointed this out, that a lot of the spiritual figures uh, throughout the ages, the most famous ones, had outer body experiences from all the way from Vishnu to Odin to Hermes, Krishna, Vishnu, you know, even the Gnostics, some of Jesus' disciples. Maybe you can touch on that for us if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So, yes, it just shows how widespread outer body experiences are. So Jesus, even in mainstream Christianity, um, while he's dead in the tomb, is believed to have traveled out of his body to hell and then returned before he resurrected. Odin, who is the chief god of the Germanic pagans, he is known to have the ability to be able to astral project. Then you have Krishna as well in India. Um, he goes on an out-of-body experience together with his disciple Arjuna and um, Hermes Trismegistus, so in the famous um, Hermetic texts, the most famous set of Hermetic texts, um, he has an out-of-body experience. And um, Zoroaster, the founder of Zoroastrianism in Iran, um, he also goes on an out-of-body yeah. experience. So yes, really incredible that yeah, a lot of these spiritual figures were able to astral project or were said to have been able to astral project and had um, out-of-body experiences which are recorded in some of the most famous uh, religious texts in the world. Welcome to a Broader Lands podcast. The opinions expressed on Broaderlands podcasts are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or Broaderlands podcast. Welcome to Broaderlands podcast. What an honor for, for you to be on here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Maybe before we get started, you can share a little bit about who you are and what you do, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I am a an author, a researcher, and a practitioner of the religion of the sun. So this is an ancient religion that my husband and I uh, discovered through our research. And basically, it is probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, known religion in the world, you know, surviving religion in the world. Um, it gave rise to all the different traditions of um, ancient sun worship in places like Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, India, Iran, the Americas, and Europe. And uh, it spread around the world uh, before recorded history. And so basically survived in these traditions. So we discovered this religion accidentally, but now we write about it and we also uh, follow it ourselves. So we've co-authored a few books about it and I've written the first history about it as well. Yeah, thank you. And tell Mark I said thank you as well, because this is an amazing book. If you guys haven't found this book yet, I highly encourage you guys to, to, to grab a copy because it's awesome. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. I will. <laughs> you have a, a part a section in your book that talks about ancient otherworldly experiences from from dreams to outer body experiences and near death experiences. And you said it's a part of our human exp experience. And I love that. Maybe uh, before we get started, you can share a little bit about um, outer body experiences. What is an outer body experience? Okay, sure. So scientists um, tend to use a definition that we seem to see ourselves from a location outside of our body. Um, but we think that is already a bit biased by using the word seems um, because it makes it out to be illusory. So we prefer to use the definition that someone perceives that they are out of their body. And based on our experience, so we both had experiences, a lot of out-of-body experiences. So Mark has about um, 30 years of out-of-body experience. Um, I have about... 20 years of practicing out-of-body experiences and wow. um, we would say that um, it is an actual experience of consciousness being outside of its physical body. Thank you. And you, you said um, in your book there's three different types of outer body experiences. Can you touch on that for us? Yeah, sure. So um, basically, like you said, they are a natural part of human experience. So um, people throughout time have had them. There are three sort of main ways that we can have an out-of-body experience. So one is um, what people know as astral projection. So that's when you actually feel yourself separating from your physical body. And um, that usually happens when you're in a in the transition between waking and sleeping. So as you're falling asleep, what actually happens is we enter um, into 
a different realm, a non-physical realm. We leave our bodies behind. Um, so this is typically how people have an out-of-body experience mostly. But it can also happen spontaneously through a trauma or a very stressful event. Um, but most of the time it happens when people are, in, like I said, falling asleep. Uh, we can also have it by waking up in a dream. So that's by becoming aware of being in a dream. And we're basically in the same place um, that we are when we just astral project. Um, so because it's a place we go to when we dream. And then the third way is having a near-death experience. So this happens when we die and then people who revive can give an account of actually having left their body. You ever find that, you mentioned in your book about some of us have it spontaneously out of nowhere. You, there's some experiences like that as well, right? Yes. So um, it's actually very common um, to have an out-of-body experience. So in different studies, about 10 to 50% of people have had at least one out-of-body experience in their life. Um, so that's as many as half of all people um, have had an out-of-body experience. And like you said, they can just happen spontaneously um, without people trying, although it's possible to learn how to have an out-of-body experience consciously um, by using sort of meditative style techniques, um, which is something we go through in the book. Um, so yeah, about 95% of all cultures worldwide hold beliefs about out-of-body experiences. Um, so that just shows how widespread um, out-of-body experiences and, you know, the beliefs in them are. You know, I've had out-of-body experiences, a few different ones, and I shared one with you, that shared death experience. But the second one, it's like not, I'm not traveling anywhere. Like I, I've never had no profound out-of-body experience, but I remember looking at, I had to use the restroom. I had to go number one in the, and I was in Ohio in the woods and I, I, um, I'm on a job site. We're building a new house and there's no, you know, nowhere to go. So I went in the woods and I'm looking into a flower and it's about my height, the, the flower. And, um, all of a sudden I found myself falling into this, uh, outer body experience. I, I don't know how that happened. Um, and I felt I dissolved. I was no longer a part of the five sense reality. And I was one with the all, pure consciousness. Wow. When I wasn't identified with my mind or body, I was just in a liveness, a state of aliveness and oneness. I wasn't even thinking about anything. I had no mind, if that makes sense. And I felt like mm -hmm. I was slipping in and out of this for a couple couple days, you know, and it finally went away. It was weird. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That sounds really profound. Yeah, so normally out-of-body experiences happen, like I say, when we fall asleep. So this is when the astral body actually separates from the physical one. But there are lots of different other types of mystical experiences that you can have where you can lose sense of your body, um, mm. which sounds like what's happened. I also had like experiences where I was um, just like so um, centered in the true self, you know, or self or, you know, the all. And uh, I was still in my body, but I was like still like something was glowing inside. Like I was not connected to the body. I have some little experiences like that. And I just felt connected with everything. And it was weird. Like I could feel like out of my body, but in my body at the same time. Mm. I remember that happening. Kind of some weird experiences. But you, in the book, you talk about, um, you know, a lot. And I love how you, you guys... Uh, pointed this out that a lot of the spiritual figures uh, throughout the ages, the most famous ones had outer body experiences from all the way from Vishnu to Odin to Hermes, Krishna, Vishnu, you know, even the Gnostics, some of Jesus's disciples. Maybe you can touch on that for us if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So yes, it just shows how widespread outer body experiences are. So Jesus, even in mainstream Christianity, um, while he's dead in the tomb, is believed to have traveled out of his body to hell and then returned before he resurrected. Odin, who is the chief god of the Germanic pagans, he is known to have the ability to be able to astral project. Then you have Krishna as well in India. Um, he goes on an out-of-body experience together with his disciple Arjuna and um, Hermes Trismegistus, so in the famous um, Hermetic texts, the most famous set of Hermetic texts, um, he has an out-of-body experience. And um, Zoroaster, the founder of Zoroastrianism in Iran, um, he also goes on an out-of-body yeah. experience. 
So yes, really incredible that yeah, a lot of these spiritual figures were able to astral project or were said to have been able to astral project and had um, out-of-body experiences which are recorded in some of the most famous uh, religious texts in the world. Yeah, thank you. Astral travel, astral projection, remote viewing, is that all the same thing, just different terms? Um, so astral projection is when we leave our bodies. Astral travel is once we've already left our bodies and are traveling in what's known as the astral plane. We also t refer to it as the fifth dimension. Um but it was given lots of different names in different ancient traditions. Um, remote viewing is a bit different where um, I don't have a lot of experience with that at all, but that's something my husband Mark has done and you sort of stay in your body, but you are trying to see things at a distant location. Do you mind sharing an experience maybe your of your husband's or yours? Yeah, sure. Wow. Okay. So there's some, um, that's a lot to call on. So my husband writes about an experience um, that he had where he actually um, found himself in what he believes was the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. So he had actually become conscious out of the body um, and found himself um, walking through uh, a corridor um, with Egyptian deities and then walked into a stone chamber which everything was very uh, sometimes in out-of-body experiences it can be um, extremely clear and vivid and just feel as real sometimes even more real than here in the physical world so this was a very real experience that he had and um, he found that they were sitting around the chamber in the pose that they're shown in ancient Egyptian artwork, which is kind of with their legs sort of um, tucked up, not in the oriental position. It's a bit different in ancient Egypt. And he was invited to look into a, a pool of water um, that was reflecting the stars through a long um, shaft. And as he looked into the, the water, it started to swirl and he sort of felt himself get pulled back to his body and he woke up. Um, but he later found out that in the Great Pyramid there are star shafts, what they call star shafts. They're not sure of what their purpose is, but he hadn't known that. So um, sometimes that can happen in out-of-body experiences that you see things that you later verify in the physical world that you didn't know um, about beforehand. So, yeah, it's a, a way of verifying that your experience, there's something real about it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um you also um you you talk about near death experiences and you hear a lot about that these days near death experiences i think you use the term after death experiences which i loved yeah that's right yeah yeah would you share with us what a near death experience is yeah sure so basically it's when someone dies um but later revives and they have an experience of they're dead, so they, their consciousness actually continues, their experience continues. And uh, there's a lot of commonalities between people's near-death experiences um, across different cultures and even across time. So we've looked at um, near-death experiences in ancient, ancient times. Um, there are surviving accounts of near-death experiences from different ancient cultures, and they share similarities with near-death experiences today of you know, there's um, a few common elements of them. One of the main ones is that um, people separate, feel themselves separate from their bodies, uh, continue to perceive where they are. Let's say it's in a hospital and they can see um, people working on them, trying to revive them, and often see um, things happening in the hospital that they later verify as having really happened, um, but they couldn't have known since they were let's say, brain dead or their heart had stopped, so they'd actually died, but they'd, they'd been able to accurately describe um, what was happening to them while they were dead. And then often people have a life review. Um, they're, they're shown all the events of their life. They relive them, um, but seeing them from the perspective of what was most important, and that's often shown to them as being how they treated others and how loving they were. And uh, many people also experience going through a tunnel towards the light, and the light um, they perceive as um, God or the creator, the source, and sometimes visit heavenly regions, also visit 
hellish regions. And these are all elements that are common across time and culture. Yeah, thank you. And I love how you guys use the uh, Upanishads and it shows in the scriptures how it talks about we don't die, only our body. We go into the non-physical form. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it also sheds, sheds that same light of uh, knowledge and wisdom and says we shouldn't grieve because we don't really die who we really are. Yeah, that's right. So this is, again, very common in um, in ancient texts and traditions, this understanding. And, you know, we would say particularly um, in the ancient religion of the sun, but yes, it's found in many different traditions. I remember being at a unity church one time and um, the reverend was uh, reading a, um, a book about someone that had this near-death experience, saw Jesus. And after she was sharing, she was asking questions and answers. And I asked, uh, what about on the East? Because why do people on the East that have near-death experiences experience, like uh, for an example, I just recorded with a lady named Ritu who was raised in India and she's seen divas and gods that yeah. came to her in her near-death experience. Why do they, why don't they, if some people will see Jesus or, or others will see the Buddha from the West, but it has a lot to do with our, our belief systems and our conditioning, right? Why, why does that happen? Do you believe you and Mark? Okay. Yeah. So this is, um, I think something really interesting that emerges, um, once you've seen or read a lot of different near death experiences is that you start to see that the experience is really tailored to the individual. So, so it's, it's very um, personal to them in what they need to learn and understand. Hmm. So people are often shown things in the way that they'll be able to um, digest and relate to on the best because that's the most important. It's what they learn and take from the experience individually rather than, um, let's say, the the truth of any particular religious form. Those um, religious forms that are used are the ones that they're going to most readily um, feel comfortable with and understand. And people have even had near-death experiences where they've been told this. So um, this is why, you know, people find sometimes contradictions between near-death experiences, why uh, Jesus can look different to different people. You know, some people in near-death experiences have even been told that Jesus will appear to people in the way that they prefer, that they would like to see him. So what's most important a lot of the time is that those who have died feel comforted and also that they're able to um, understand the message that's been given to them. So that's a really important thing is a message that they take from it. You know, one of the most beautiful things uh, I love listening to people that have these near-death experiences is the life review they, they talk about going through. And um, I, I relate to that to my own awakening. And Francis said it's only by dying that one awakens to eternal life. I went through the 12 steps, you know, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's a section where it's called the, uh, taking a moral inventory, step four. And I felt like I did my own life review through this process. And I started to see how I hurt people and how it affected people along with myself and, and the, the ripple effect with my life. And we're all connected. So I, I really relate to the life review. Can you share a little bit about the life review people have? Yeah, sure. So that's, that's excellent. You were able to do that. And it's great that you're able to do that in life rather than waiting for the end of life. Uh, it's uh, the life review is one of the most common experiences that people have after death. And again, this also appears in ancient near-death experiences. So it shows that it is very much part of the process of death for a lot of people. And um, those that um, really what's, what's really um, important in life. So is about how our actions affect other people is what's most important. And uh, like I said, how much we've loved and cared for other people. That's a really great thing that you're able to take from from the life review is actually learning to to integrate that and do that now. So to consider our actions and to and to learn to love others and to act in a loving way now uh, and to really actively use our life uh, to learn as we go along. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I didn't realize that until I started to interview people that had near-death experiences and they talk about this life review and I'm like, hey, I had... I, I did that, yeah. you know, because yeah, and, and the fruits of it is we come back with more compassion, come out of that with more compassion, more understanding and more spiritual insights. 
and, and connectedness. I mean, at least that's my experience. And I hear that with a lot of people that experience that as well. So that near death experience, that life review. And I was wondering, yeah. is that, is that the uh, ancient comedic or Egyptian way of trying to describe when they talk about the story of the weighing of the heart, do you believe? Yeah. So the weighing of the heart is really interesting because it shows that the ancient Egyptians um, understood that it's our actions, whether um, positive or good or bad, um, determine our destination in the afterlife. And this is something that people have also been shown in near-death experiences where they've sort of had to give or had been called into account for what they've done in life and have really been assessed as to whether their good or bad deeds outweigh the other. And, and that's determined which realm they move on to in the afterlife um, because really how we behave determines um, what lessons we need to learn next. And um, another really interesting part of that scene is the crocodile uh, goddess Amet or the crocodile-headed goddess Amet sort of waits to devour the hearts of those whose bad deeds have outweighed their good. And... Um, that's because people have actually seen what's been called the mouth of hell. So the entrance into hell, which has appeared like the mouth of a great beast. So Mark had spoken to a lady who had actually had a near-death experience and entered the jaws of a crocodile um, mm. to go into hell. And she knew nothing about ancient Egyptian religion. So this um, later became depicted in Christian iconography as the mouth of hell, and it's also found among the ancient Maya of Mexico, who depicted the mouth of the underworld as the as a, the head of a great or the jaws of a great serpent or monster. So it shows that there is some common experience behind what these ancient people were depicting. In your book, you, one of the major topics is dreams. Um, you talk about dreams and different types of dreams and, and the meanings. Along with lucid dreaming, um, I remember as a little boy, I always had dreams. I always had all kinds of crazy dreams from astral travel. I could, I was floating and going to different universes and planets and dimensions to, to a point where in my adult life, like now, I, I don't remember any dreams. And you touch on that in the very beginning of that section. I think it's page 333. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and you talk about how we all have dreams, whether we remember them or not. I don't no longer remember my dreams. <laughs> yeah, so what can help with that is, um, and that's very common, what can help with that is really actively trying to be aware of the present moment as you can. So as you're doing things in the day, you know, it's just normal to be thinking about what you're doing and thinking about the future and um, perhaps, you know, going over conversations in your mind about, you know, who you're going to speak to or someone you've spoken to. And so um, what helps with remembering dreams is really trying to um, be as present as you can. And that level of consciousness that we have in the day can actually transfer over into the night so we can start um, to become more conscious in our dreams, meaning that we can start to have um, just clearer dreams. We start to remember them better. And also just trying to, there are techniques for remembering dreams better. So um, just even wanting to remember dreams and spending some time in the morning trying to remember dreams can actually train you to start um, remembering them better. Uh, lying still particularly helps as that's when um, when we just wake up our astral body hasn't quite merged into the physical one and so it can actually help us to remember dreams better. So there are a few different things that you can do uh, to remember dreams better but everyone I mm. uh, can learn to do that. Thank you. What, what is lucid dreaming? So lucid dreaming is when we become aware of being in a dream. So we actually realize that we're dreaming and um, we can then consciously uh, determine what we do. So normally when we're dreaming, we have no idea that we're in a dream, mm. um, even though we could be doing just the most bizarre and ridiculous things. Um, so lucid dreaming is yeah becoming aware of being in a dream and um in, and then we have an experience of being outside of our body in the astral plane consciously. So there are techniques to be able to learn how to wake up in dreams 
And it's actually a real experience of being out of the body and you can verify that by um, seeing something uh, from lucid dreaming that you can later verify in the physical world. And there are people, many people have done that. I've done that myself. You talk about the ancient religion quite often in your, on your, you have a great, you guys have a great uh, YouTube channel, by YouTube the way. YouTube channel, as well. yeah. yeah. And, uh, c can you touch on that for us? Yeah, sure. So uh, we call it the ancient religion of the sun. Basically, this ancient religion survived in lots of different traditions. So it's, um, it doesn't survive today. Um, it only survives in the different traditions that it gave rise to. In this particular um, religion, the sun was venerated as the supreme symbol of the divine, of the source. And uh, we call it the spiritual sun because people are often thought to have been worshipping the physical sun. But ancient texts actually describe how people understood uh, there to be a spiritual source behind the sun and that the sun Brilliant. was actually a manifestation of that spiritual or higher light, which is really interesting because in near-death experiences, people often see God or the creator as a light, which they describe as being like the sun, though thousands of times brighter. I'm sure ancient people had uh, similar experiences. So this ancient religion uh, spread across the world. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for that, you know, we find um, pyramids, for example, all over the world that were aligned to the sun, particularly at the solstices and equinoxes, which are the main uh, transitions of the sun each year. And these clearly had a very profound significance, a spiritual significance to them, which is why so many sites around the world are aligned to these times of year. And uh, there are lots of different commonalities between these ancient religions, um, which I go through in my book, that show that they all derive from the same source, a very ancient religion, um, yeah, that spread around the world before the beginning of recorded history. Yeah, I love how you touch on the winter solstice, for an example, and there's many different, in all the different traditions of the ancients, there's many celebrations and holy days, now we call it holidays. Um, it wasn't just Jesus, you know, I wonder if they kind of brought, you know, Jesus is wearing the corona, around, you know, the, the crown. And uh, I am the light of the world. Do you think some of they were they inherited some of these old pagan traditions in Christianity? Absolutely. So, this theme of sort of a dying and resurrecting God, uh, who was associated with the sun and whose main life events occurred at the solstices and equinoxes, is something we find uh, long before Jesus. So, of course, we find it in ancient Egypt with Osiris. Um, we also find it in Europe and uh, the Americas, uh, vast distances away. So there was clearly um, this shared tradition, and it has a, a more um, a deeper symbolic meaning. So it actually relates, relates to the journey of consciousness uh, toward enlightenment. And so the sun god was used to portray this sort of journey of consciousness on the path of the sun, which path of the spiritual sun we call it. And yeah, Jesus, his life events also match that path. We think that um, he was, there's evidence that he was actually consciously trying to portray this path uh, through his life, through his life events as a continuation of this ancient religion. Thank you. You also mentioned um, the children of the sun, these demigods that are you can find all over the world these giants. Were they giants? I mean, you see Akhenaten, taller and really elongated skull, worshipping the sun. And you guys show um, some hieroglyphs from that in your book also. And you see the Druids with some symbolism. Who are these uh, children of the sun? So, like you say, in ancient traditions across the world, there are uh, ancient stories and legends of more spiritually perceptive people, a lot of characteristics that they're described as having in common, and one of them is that they were much taller. And actually, there's quite a lot of evidence in the archaeological record for giants having existed. So there are ancient depictions of giants. Um, there have been discoveries of giant skeletons. And, you know, there's legends in all sorts of Native traditions, Native American, American traditions of, of giants. Um, having lived long ages ago. And these these people were described as 
the builders of great megaliths as having worshipped the sun. Um, but at some point, oh, and being the keepers of great uh, spiritual wisdom and having supernatural powers in some cases. Uh, so they, at some point, though, were said to have become arrogant. And this mm. ties in with the story of Atlantis, where they had sort of lost their spiritual qualities through um, intermingling and interbreeding with human beings. And they gradually became shorter and also became very warlike and aggressive and were eventually destroyed. They were understood as having been destroyed in a great global cataclysm. And um, some of the survivors from their ancient civilization uh, were remembered as having founded some of the ancient sun-worshipping traditions that we know of today. So it actually goes back to, we think the ancient religion of the sun goes back to these people we've called the children of the sun because they were known by lots of different names around the world. So we've just given them a name that we call them by. And um, yes, they uh, they disappeared, but they were known as a source of the ancient religion of the sun in a very, very distant past. Yeah, and you can find them, these stories all around the world, right? From the gods of yes. Zip Tepe, the um, Maya. That's right. Uh, Anunnaki, uh, Anunnaki. The, maybe, maybe the Nephilim, Nephilim, the Nephilim. or the yes. Elohim. Yes, that's right. Yep. Yep. Uh, you guys came up with a theory about these ancient sites, um, whether it be the ziggurats in Mesopotamia or the Temple of Kuku Khan in, in, in Mesoamerica, the Great Pyramids. And so uh, you guys are saying that uh, maybe you could touch on that about these ancient sites and their practices with out-of-body experience. Yeah, sh so sure. So basically what we discovered is that some of these ancient sites uh, appear to have been used for having out-of-body experiences. And uh, one of the sites is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Um, there are ancient sites in Europe as well, um, which are similar in that they have an inner chamber, a small inner chamber, um, which was remembered as having been used as, for journeys to the other world. But there are pyramids also in different parts of the world, in many places, and they were remembered in similar ways as being places where they connected the different realms of the cosmos together. And they were known as places where one could travel to them. So uh, this was because uh, they were built as a symbol of what's called the world mountain. So this is actually a symbol we find all over the world. And again, there's an indicator that there was a shared cosmology um, from practicing a shared religion in the long distant past. So these places became remembered as places where one could travel to different realms and, and contact beings from other realms. But in Egypt, particularly in Europe, um, there are clear indications that the inner chambers of these sites were used for having out-of-body experiences. You know, even in Ohio, you see the Serpent Mound, which is about foot, four football fields long if you were to straighten out that serpent. It lines up perfectly with the sun at a particular time of the year. Um, and, and they say there's rumors that the Native Americans say that they didn't build these. It was by the giants. That might be a part of the children of the sun. Yeah, so it actually aligns to summer solstice sunset. Um, but there are also other astronomical alignments, you know, it's sort of... Um, squiggles and the coils of its of its body actually align to um, other things as well that indicate that it was built much earlier than is is properly believed. So it goes back thousands of years. And yes, there are similar sites even in uh, Scotland in Europe. And so uh, there are a lot of similarities between sites in Europe and North America. And it shows that there was some uh, contact between these places, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago when, for example, Stonehenge was meant to have been built in Avebury. Very similar sites were being built in North America. So it shows that there was some contact between these places and a shared religion, again, that was centered around the sun. Even Gobekli Tepli in Turkey, um, you talk you talk about in, in your book, um, you know, and... and on this um, Serpent Mountain in Ohio, you see this serpent and you see this serpent throughout the Americas and around the world, this symbology. 
Um, in Gobekli Tepe, they have the um, the handbag, which you find in Mexico and you find in Sumer with the Sumerians. Um, I wonder if that was all a part of Atlantis. You know, was that a logo, the serpent for for Atlantis or Lumeria? Have you guys come come up with any ideas on that? Is there a connection? Yeah, so the serpent uh, symbolized lots of different things um, mm -hmm. in ancient religions. Of course, one thing that it's commonly been used to symbolize is what's known as Kundalini. So that's found in India and also in Egypt, um, where they have the serpent that was believed to be raised up the spine and sort of appears on the brow of the pharaohs. So again, that's a, a shared belief and symbol um, in ancient times. Um, the, hand the handbag, yes, I, you know, I've seen that symbol pop up as well, you know, in different parts of the world. And uh, again, that indicates that there was a, a shared contact between all these places a very long time ago. So Gobekli Tepe, you mentioned 9600 BC, that's dated to. And so it shows that there was um, a transmission of uh, shared religious ideas across the world uh, a very long time ago, um, before, you know, our sort of Western civilization spread. And many thousands of years ago, there was uh, contact between all these ancient civilizations, which again is why we know that they shared, shared a common religion. How older do you think these sites are? You know, from what we've been told. Well, this is the thing. Megaliths are often uh, very difficult to date. You can't often date the site itself. You're only looking at surrounding evidence to try and date it. But that might just be, um, you know, the sort of latest surviving um, evidence of occupation. But often the people who um, occupied these sites actually have traditions that they were there before um, they occupied the site and that they date back to a very distant past, and that's that's fairly common. Uh, so, for example, you know, when the Spanish went to the Americas, a lot of the time when they um, went to these different sites, they would ask, you know, the indigenous people who had built them, and they would say, well, it wasn't us. You know, it was, you know, this sort of race of sort of demigods, these people who were here long before us. So these sites could be much, much older than they're, they're said to be. And particularly, um, this is the case with the Great Pyramids. You know, the astronomical alignments of the Great Pyramids indicate that they could be maybe even tens of thousands of years older than they're said to be. Thank you. you often hear about um, the mushroom religion. Some people bring up and psychedelics. Uh, do, do you believe these ancients uh, use practices with psychedelics to have these outer body experiences? So we looked through as many ancient texts and records as we could as to what techniques people were using in ancient times to have outer body experiences. And what we found is that probably the most common um, technique that people were using in traditions of the ancient religion of the sun, so for example in Hindu texts um, or Taoist texts is that they were using um, meditative style techniques to leave their body naturally. Um, and we give sort of renditions of these ancient techniques in our book. So often they would involve stilling one's mind while going to sleep and concentrating, yeah. often visualizing the stars and even attempting to harness um, star energy to be able to consciously leave the body. So these techniques were simply using our own natural abilities. Psychedelics are, not, um, are used um, in shamanism a lot. In the ancient religion of the sun, there, were, uh, there are records of people taking a kind of blend of substances to have an experience out of the body, experience of the other world. No one knows what these substances were, but they weren't intended to be psychedelic. Uh, what they were intended to do was to actually put someone into a near-death state, yeah. so to actually bring them very close to death uh, so that they could have uh, essentially a near-death experience. So obviously this is something we completely recommend against. Um, it's, it's very dangerous, but this is often confused 
with having a psychedelic experience. But like I said, this is, it was very different to actually um, having a psychedelic experience or using psychedelics, although the, a psychedelic use does appear to have come in much later. And again, that's something I would recommend against using personally um, as psychedelics. Like I said, a lot of the records of ancient techniques are of using natural methods like meditative style techniques to consciously astral project. How do you guys feel about ayahuasca now that it got really popular, people having these experiences? Yeah, so in the book we devote a chapter to psychedelics and basically there are some uh, big differences between psychedelic experiences and um, out-of-body experiences, for example, and other um, mystical experiences. So again, after looking at all the studies and and you know have, having had out-of-body experiences naturally myself, I personally recommend against taking ayahuasca. And so the reason for this is that so basically, when we have an out-of-body experience, this can either happen through being given spiritual help or any kind of mystical experience. This could be given often given through having spiritual help. So spiritual beings will help us to have an experience. Um, it can also happen through our own dedicated practice and, and through discipline. So just training ourselves um, to, let's say, be able to concentrate or to, to meditate and, and to actually have some kind of contact with, you know, the spiritual realm and to have a spiritual experience. Um, in both cases, that gives us, that's through having a relationship with the divine. So when we, um, with psychedelic experiences, they're simply a result of just taking a substance. So that doesn't, um, whether we have a relationship with the divine or, or not, it's simply a matter of taking a substance which alters the chemistry in our brain to allow us to have, you know, a psychedelic experience to see uh, visions. And this can have impacts on us um, psychologically. So people, for instance, can continue to see visions and hallucinations even when they don't want to, when they want it to stop. It can even continue for years later. So psychedelic experiences happen beyond our control. We're not able to stop them. Whereas with a mystical right. experience that we're having, you know, through a natural, naturally learning to have it ourselves, something that we can stop, have some kind of control over. So um, psychedelic experiences, we think uh, what's happening is that they are actually um, forcing our perception open to the fifth dimension or the astral plane, like I said, by altering the chemistry of our brain. And, and like I said, that can actually have um, an effect long term on on um, the finer mechanisms of our, our brain and psyche. And it also doesn't, um, it can also mean that we're simply open um, to perceptions of the fifth dimension, but they're often um, very coloured by our own subconscious projections. So there are a lot of differences between actual the content of psychedelic experiences and let's say a natural, naturally derived spiritual experience, particularly given by spiritual beings. So in psychedelic experiences, for example, um, people often see sort of kaleidoscopic visions and, you know, often people say they see elves and things like uh, giant insects and clowns and it can lots of very colorful sort of morphing visions and so on whereas in let's say an out-of-body experience um, it's much more stable you you don't see things like clowns or giant insects you know you, yeah. you often see things that you can later verify in the physical world so you've had like a real experience of being outside the body in a psychedelic experience people often just you know, see the visions um, overlaid over the top of their, the physical reality, so they're not actually leaving their body. They're simply sort of forcing this sort of perception open to the fifth dimension without going through the natural stage and process of sleep, which we do leave our body. So, And, and the experiences, like I say, can be very uh, chaotic and incoherent compared to an experience which we have naturally, um, in which we have a kind of a, a connection with and a relationship with the divine. Do you think we should be doing inner work before we start to practice these techniques? 
to have these experiences? Yes, um, I think it it should accompany them. So in in ancient texts, astral projection and out of body experiences, how to have them was usually kept very secret, and it was understood that um, it was very important to only share it with people who would use it wisely and for good. Mm. Um, people who you know working on themselves and trying to um, better themselves spiritually so who are working for their own self-development so that the the techniques wouldn't be um, misused and mishandled by people who might not use them for benevolent purposes and really it's for our own benefit to actually use uh, out-of-body experiences um, to further our own spiritual development so it's 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 very easy or just very common for people to be interested in astral projection and to really um, not have very meaningful experiences to just kind of fly around and, and not do much. But there's so much potential to use out-of-body experiences uh, to learn about ourselves and to learn uh, what we need to do uh, to gain spiritual knowledge that's going to help us in our own spiritual journey and self-development. Thank you. Um, I just finished recording it with my friend Maya. I've done a couple of ep episodes with her and she um, she focuses on psychic attacks and entity attachments. And she said that you got to be very careful when you use psychedelics or ayahuasca or even having outer body experiences. She talks about um, you can develop entity attachments and um, you guys bring up uh, meeting different beings in the book, with even dark entities, you know, angels and demons, fairies, God. Should we be careful when we have these experiences? And uh, maybe you can touch on the dark entities in some of these experiences, even extraterrestrials, like you mentioned in the book. So there's uh, lots, a variety of different beings that we can meet and interact with in out-of-body experiences. Um, that's because there are beings that populate other realms um, that, you know, may not have a, a, a physical body here. So to interact with those beings out of the body, uh, they've been written about and recorded in ancient cultures and traditions across the world, and they share many different, many commonalities. So they can be kind of broadly categorized into um, different types of beings. There are spiritual beings, like, beings. like we've talked about, beings that are benevolent and uh, working to help us and for the greater good. Um, there are also male male malevolent entities, so which are basically most commonly known as demons. Um, and these, again, described in ancient traditions that long predate Christianity. You know, they're described in ancient Egypt, um, in Samaria, in in India, in the Americas, and so they can work to they work to harm people, and particularly uh, when we ask to project. If someone is looking to use out of body experiences for a spiritual purpose, they often come to try and scare people and to stop them um, from pursuing the out of body experiences further. And so there are ways of protecting oneself against them. So in ancient times, people used different methods of protection, protection that can still be used today. Um, and so it's possible to just protect yourself from them, be able to continue traveling. So they don't, um, they don't harm us physically. They're more there to sort of frighten us and scare us. And, and try and stop us in that way. But it's possible to deal with them and to move on. And I mean, I know many people, Mark, myself, who've been um, attacked many times by demonic entities while out of the body, and it's possible to to use um, incantations of light against them and be able to dispel them and, and, and move on. Um, and there are also lots of other different types of entities we can interact with and we can see other people who are having out-of-body experiences. It's possible to meet up wow. out of the body consciously with other people. Yeah, we can meet extraterrestrials out of the body like us. They can also travel out of the body. So there's no reason why we can't uh, meet them out of the body. And I know many people um, who have, and I've had my own experience of, of meeting extraterrestrials out of the body. And there are other beings too. Um, it's possible even to interact with the source, which is one of the most common experiences and near-death experiences that people um, interact with 
the source or the creator or God, um, whatever you wish to call it. Hmm. So that's possible to do out of the body as well. I just finished uh, my latest episode. It was with Mary Rodwell, who wrote the book, The New Human Awakening to Our Cosmic Heritage. And she really explains um, in the book how a lot of these abductions are outer body experiences. And when I opened up your book, you guys share a little bit about that as well. Could you touch on that a little more? Yeah, sure. So um, alien abduction is a really complex phenomenon. Um, so there can be different reasons why people have an alien abduction experience. One, the ones that we focus on are the ones to do with out-of-body experiences. And so it's really interesting that one of the most common elements of alien abduction is that they usually begin with a feeling of sleep paralysis. So mm. sleep paralysis is a sense of being completely immobilized um, as you're lying in bed at night, you know, transitioning in and out of sleep. And uh, it often begins with an episode of, of sleep paralysis and then they, they feel, feel themselves, themselves, let's say, being taken out of their body onto a craft. And what this indicates is that what's actually happening is that the, the alien abduction is actually taking place um, in the fifth dimension out of the body. And this is a conclusion that John Mack came to who studied lots of different um, alien abduction experiences. So he was actually head of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and he realized that these were, a lot of these were actually interdimensional experiences that they weren't actually happening in the physical. You talk about in your book about preparing conscious preparation for these experiences. Uh, how do you guys, what kind of techniques do you guys use or practices to be prepared for these experiences? So basically the main way to have a conscious out-of-body experience, so to actually per purposely astral project, is to keep your mind uh, still and concentrated as you're falling asleep. So yeah. it's often been said to keep your mind awake as your body falls asleep. So normally as we fall asleep, we just kind of drift into our subconscious, we drift into unconsciousness and dreams. So it's it's by keeping our consciousness awake that we remain aware through the process of leaving our body, which happens every time we fall asleep. It's just we're not normally aware of it. So this um, technique is actually um, recorded in ancient texts. So they talk about keeping your mind still or keeping it concentrated by focusing, for example, on the stars so you can visualize the stars and that keeps your mind focused on one thing as you're falling asleep and people use this to actually um, astral project into the stars so we looked like i said we looked through um, all the ancient records we could find of the different techniques people were using to have um, out-of-body experiences in ancient times and we've put together a series of techniques based on that so a series of ancient visualizations. But the way to actually prepare for these practices is to learn how to concentrate one's mind. This is something that um, can take a lot of training. We're not used to um, keeping our mind focused. We're multitasking, doing lots of different things, thinking all the time. So it's actually a matter of training ourselves to be able to keep our mind settled and focused on one thing. So we have a chapter dedicated to being able to learn to concentrate so that you can apply that skill to all the different techniques of astral projection because they're all essentially based on being able to focus and concentrate one's mind. What's the spiritual purpose for these these experiences? So I think um, near-death experiences give a great insight into what the purpose of these experiences can be. And like you saw with the life review, what was really important was our own self-development and how we relate to others, how we um, overcome our own um, deficiencies, our you know negative behaviors, you know things like angers and hatreds and and ill will, and and overcoming those to be able to um, be more loving essentially. And out of body experiences, a lot of the time can actually show us where where our deficiencies are. So often people think of, you know, having out of body experiences to, you know, travel and and see the pyramids and and to um, 
you know, maybe meet a friend or, you know, go to a distant place or see something they haven't ever seen before or fly in the stars. And um, these are certainly things you can do. And that can be a really life-changing experience in itself just to be out of the body. But once you start to really um, learn to have them for a spiritual purpose, a lot of the time um, what you can be shown are things that you need to um, improve and correct within yourself in terms of your own behavior towards others. So, um, yeah, that's a, a really important way to use them. And that, again, comes through near-death experiences where a lot of the time that's what people are shown after they die is how they need to improve and work upon themselves. What's your uh, understanding, you and Mark's understanding, on the ancient Egyptian Ka and Ba with these experiences? Yeah, so the Ka and Ba, so these are two um, non-physical aspects that the ancient Egyptians believe that every person had. Um, there are also other non-physical aspects that they spoke about, but the Ka and Ba um, were common to everybody. And the Ka is basically like a, a kind of a, a double, an energy body uh, that has been written about in other ancient traditions as well. Um, the Ba was their uh, version of the soul, essentially. It was everything of a person that lived on after death, minus their Ka. So the Ba was, yeah, basically... You know, it wasn't the, some people say maybe it was the astral body, but basically um, it was just everything of the person, their consciousness, who they continued to be after they died, minus their physical body and the car, which was, like I said, a kind of an energetic double. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, uh, there are other ancient traditions that talk about um, non physical aspects that we have as well, like in India um, and in Tibet. And so basically, this sort of energetic double, it's kind of like a, you know, Mark calls it the personality. It's something we sort of develop in one life and we sort of discard um, at the end of our life. And that's what people commonly see as ghosts. So, yeah, it's really interesting that mm -hmm. um, in ancient traditions, you know, people also recognize these different non physical parts of us and realize that we are um, essentially multi dimensional beings. I feel like you and Mark are old souls. Do you guys, how do you guys look at reincarnation and the purpose of reincarnation and the purpose of life? Yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of evidence for reincarnation. This was um, a fundamental belief in in a lot of ancient traditions, and it was, um, I believe, in the ancient religion of the sun. So again, this is a theme that um, appears a lot in near-death experiences. People are often shown that they've had past lives, um, that they're going to have a next life, and are told that um, we have many lives in which we need to gradually learn and um, develop our soul. And that takes a lot of time um, through lots of different circumstances. So, yeah, I think that definitely ties in with the, the purpose of life as being um, this being a place of learning where we where we develop our soul essentially through learning through all the different circumstances the difficulties and interactions of lots of different lives thank you i appreciate you coming on i really do and um you know is there any links or websites or anything to reach you or how do we find your book sure so um have a website um sacrosarwell.com so sacro s-a-k-r-o Sarwell, S A W E L dot com. It means sacred sun in an ancient Proto Indo European language. So we chose that because um, that's closer to the language spoken by many of the people who would have practiced the ancient religion of the sun. So you can find um, links to all our books on that website. Um, I also have a YouTube channel, like you mentioned, again, Sacro Sarwell. Uh, where I do videos about different topics from the books. So, yeah, that's where you can find us. I'm going to end it with uh, your last paragraph on the book, and it says, out-of-body travel helps us to understand our purpose in living and allows us to see what exists in a phenomenon multidimensional universe. It also provides us with much-needed contact with spiritual beings and supports us on 
many ways in our spiritual journey. Thank you for helping us expand on that today with today's episode. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Bibu. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Namastizzle. Okay. <laughs> Namaste. It's no we out here. No we out here working in a major way. Had to speak on it just to make a play. Any given subject, no we make a way. Time to level up on the day to day. No we out here working for the greater good. Expand your mind, broaden your lens the way you should. From the stars to the galaxy to speak on spirituality. I understand for the neighborhood.